The first speaker, Mao Yan Zhou, is a, a PhD candidate, a fourth year PhD candidate in the Department of Architecture at the University of Hong Kong. Her research interests lie in global Renaissance and Baroque art and architecture from the 15th to the 18th centuries, with a specific focus on the ecclesiastical architecture in East Asia. Thank you, Marin. Uh, thanks, everyone, um, for attending. I would like to share my screen first. Okay. I'm going to um, share my research on St. Paul's in Macau. Okay. So in the 1650s, the official Chen Yanyu wrote a poem capturing the busy life of Portuguese merchants in Macau. The poem focuses on one of the port's most recent constructions, St. Paul's, with an emphasis on its golden, splendid, beautiful facade and the produced divine engagement. Chen's poem reveals to us the extent to which the church was understood by the Chinese locals to embody some intangible aspect of the divine. It prompts, it prompts questions as to how Jesuit missionaries in Macau worked to translate Christian, Christian faith intermingled with Portugal's and Spain's intentions into a Chinese audience. My research examines St. Paul's Church in Macau, built during the peak of the Jesuit Asian, Asia mission, and argues for the ways in which this church produced a transcendent experience for the converts to, converts to perceive the secret. Scholars have studied church architecture in Macau, but such work tends to emphasize visual descriptions of the work or the contemporary pressures of heritage conservation, nor have they looked at the church and the painting in a cohesive way. My research situates St. Paul's within a broader context of the Counter-Reformation, the, um, the age of discovery and the East-West encounter with attention to how it engendered sensory experience. As Christian D.P. and Joseph Lum suggest, the sensory approach, in fact, provides a more individual understanding of building and urban spaces in relation to the idea of interpretation that is crucial in unpacking the strategy of culture accommodation, first introduced by Alessandro Valignano, Io Suove Modo, the gentle method. So, uh... In the next 10 to 15 minutes, I want to briefly discuss these key elements of St. Paul's, in particular the facade, the floor plan, and the altarpiece. Exhibit a convoluted architectural engagement intersected with the concept of self and other, the global in circulation and connection of objects and the people, the formation of empire and imperialism. Thus, another portrait of early modern can be reviewed through a glimpse at this Sino-Euro encounter remarketed by St. Paul's. Macau sits at the mouth, sorry. Um, Macau sits at the mouth of Pearl River Delta, south of Guangzhou. So Guangzhou is here which flows out into the South China Sea. These waters have been vital for trade and exchange with ports in Malacca Straits, Indian Ocean, the Malacca Straits, Indian Ocean, Philippine Sea, and up to the Pacific Ocean since the early 16th century. Such a unique geographical location of extensive connections was further elevated by its proximity to main China. Macau was therefore ideal, meeting the purposes not only of the Portuguese merchants who opened another route away from the Ottomans, but of the Catholic world more generally. The Jesuits, motivated by the urgency of the Counter-Reformation, were determined to integrate Ming China into a broader, global, and most importantly, true Christian sphere, as Francis Xavier had centralized China in the overseas missions. 
Though the exact date of the Portuguese and Jesuit settlements in Macau was debatable, a city gate is shown here. Erected by the Ming government in 1574, indicated, indicated the active presence of the Portuguese merchants and the Jesuits that was alarming to the Ming authority. With a clear schedule of opening and closing, this city gate was constructed to separate Macau from mainland Ming China, while asserting Ming's authority and control over this territory. Within Macau, the Portuguese and the Jesuits likewise began architectural constructions for living, socializing, and the religious purposes. Among which, church, church buildings were the most physically imposing and challenging to build. Moreover, contextualized in the Counter-Reformation on a global scale, the church architecture in Macau became the most intriguing and engaging space where not only the divine Christianity met the secular Portugal in Spain in the form of royal patronage, but also this encounter was deliberately addressed to the local population. In, in 1592, Alessandro Valignano stressed the necessity to embark a Jesuit college in Macau for the incoming Jesuits, rapid growth of Chinese converts, and the relocation of the Japanese Christians who faced the harsh operation against Christianity imposed by Toyodomi Hideyoshi. In 1594, with the help of King Philip II of Spain, who united the two crowns of Spain and Portugal in 1580, the church and the College of St. Paul was finally realized. Though this reunion seemingly did not seriously affect Portugal's control over overseas matters, it more or less might have challenged the role of Portugal in the mission and the Catholic world, which was remarked by St. Paul's in Macau. Following its completion in 1594, St. Paul's was, was later reconstructed by Carlos Spignola in 1602, where remains of the church today is its famous facade captured in the Chinaris Council here. Chinaris drawing show again here. St. Paul was built on an elevated platform in the city center next to uh, the Mount Fortress that was built in mid 17th century, overlooking the city. This hilly location allows St. Paul's to be seen distantly from the sea, dominating the surrounding landscape. The church featured a flying staircase. Climbing up the stairs, when ascended to meet the facade of St. Paul's, which featured a fully embellished and a symmetrical four-storied composition. I need to note that the main body of the church was destroyed again by a fire in 1835. Besides the inscribed dedication, Matle Dei, Mother of God, here on the central gate, and the nature of a Jesuit church through JHS inscriptions here on, on two smaller doorways, the facade indeed provided a sensorial feast to the congregation before entrance. For example, on the third floor, a central bronze statue of Virgin Mary was encircled by floral patterns of roses and lilies. Angels were playing trumpets and holding incense burners. This panel celebrated the triumph of Christianity through engaging not only eyes, but also noses and ears. On the left, there was a panel of carved fountain with trickling water representing baptism and the Eucharist, next to which was a relief of a sailing ship with a sailing ship with the angel on its top left. Unequivocally, this was a representation of the oceanic empire, Portugal, with divine support. In trickling of a load, of a lute was carved with a reclining devil-like creature with an opening mouth that was likely rowing or talking. The Chinese inscription was saying, it is the devil that entices people to be evil. Now looking to the right of the bronze Virgin Mary, 
there was a relief of a pine tree with a detail of roots which featured a certain smell, symbolizing resurrection and eternity brought by Christ to this land, Macau. On the right, there was a relief. There was a relief panel depicting that a dragon-like creature with seven heads was trampled on by Virgin Mary. Similarly, an inscription somewhere here, inscription, Virgin Mary trampling on the dragon in Chinese was carved alongside the relief, not only elucidating that this church was dedicated to Virgin Mary, but also reinforcing the Christian triumph. Looking continuously to the right, a symmetrical volute was crafted with a reclining skeleton. Inscribed with, remember the death who would never sing, which perhaps was purified and forgiven by entering the church. The high legibility of this facade with large enough Chinese characters and the vivid imagery was intended to communicate the face to local Chinese. Here, I want to contextualize St. Paul's within Counter-Reformation in Catholic world in relation to Valignano's strategy, Io Suove Modo, for interpretation and engagement. The second component of my argument today pivots on the ways in which the church space manifested a global interaction, especially its architectural relationship to the motherland of the Catholic world through both its facade and the Latin cross pen. During the Counter-Reformation, the longitudinal plan was highly promoted by the Archbishop of Milan, Carlo Bromel, in, in his influential treatises, Instructions on the Erection and the Furnishings of Churches, firstly published in 1577. Both Valignano and Carlo Spagnola must have been familiar with Baromian principles, for one knew him personally and the other was chained in Milan. When designing the facade of St. Paul's, Spagnola perhaps looked to the facade of Santa Malia Blesso Santiago in Milan by Galeazzo Alesi in 1570. The multi story composition, the vibrant figural decorations, and notably the finios, those, the finios were too alike. Another Alesi's prominent project is a secular Monday for an emotional engagement, for understanding, which was essential to Jesuit's practice and visible in Macau as well. Jesuit extensively used images, objects, and buildings in preaching to overcome the linguistic barriers and yielded better communication. This emphasis on interpretation was fundamental to Val Valignano's Io Suave model, which was based upon Ignatius of Loyola's spiritual exercises that centralized individual pathways to reach God. In addition, interpretation and communication were rooted in Jesuit's learning, inspired by Cicero's rhetoric and a decorum, to delight, to teach, to move. The facade, however, was not only the was not the only evidence for such influence. Despite that the main body of the church has nothing remaining now, the longitudinal plan, uh, the Latin cross plan in particular, can still be discerned from the granite foundation and through this late 18th century uh, join. Not only was the longitudinal plan related to the early bas Christian basilica for the true faith, but it was also believed to accommodate the congregation spatially, since it's a reference to ancient basilica where the social gatherings were housed. Bromio accentuated the, the spatial engagement, including the front space of a church for pure fiction, away from the streets. Moreover, his emphasis on the liturgical order that the clergy had the full authority from choosing the proper site to the construction. St. Paul's indeed visualized Baromian teachings in Macau. An inscription of St. Paul's written by a Jesuit, Jose B. Mandania, 
reviews the floor plan and the bell tower composition that depicted an acoustic image of Macau. The ringing bell emphasized the sacred presence of the church. So here you can see, spend whatever in this work, it is with a bell tower with a terrace from which the whole city can be viewed. Not only did the facade and the floor plan represent Valignano's strategy for interpretation, but, but the altarpiece in St. Paul's also responded to the engagement and beyond. This understudied altarpiece, Michael the Archangel, that offers us that offers us a glimpse of how the church's interior may have not only reviews and integration between objects and architecture, but also tells the global circulation of people and artistic objects. Walking along the nave to the high altar, one's attention was certainly drawn to the main chapel flanked by two uh, altars. The Holy Spirit altar was on the gospel side on the left, and the Michael altar stood on the apostle side that was on the right, through which the, through which the liturgical order was articulated that mass house, hosted by the clergy was always in the center. Meanwhile, the ceremonial characteristic was underlined. The altarpiece was originally placed on the altar of San Miguel, which deliberately conveyed a whole unity of the sacred to the congregation throughout the Mass. Arguably, this altarpiece was by Il Seminario de Pinton, a seminar of painting that was founded by the Italian Jesuit Giovanni Nicolo in 1590 in Nagasaki. After the reading of the Gospel, the altarpiece with a shimmering surface and an unusual large, feature, uh, large figure of Michael surely draw one's eye during the episode reading. In addition, the use of gold implied the, the Japan-China precious metal trade through Nagasaki and Macau, an index of a change of monetary system in main China. Unlike Unlike a common iconography of Michael, this gilded altarpiece does not contain the demon. Not gripping a shield, Michael is holding a gold monstrance that is tethered by a gold chain to a tablet-like cover on the ground. I argue that the composition of this painting was not arranged well or not planned to have the demon. The missing demon, perhaps, is the one on the facade, but now is defeated and locked up under the ground by the monstrance that addresses divine power to the congregation. An integration of the church space and the painting was completed as well. The altarpiece extended the entire narration beyond the religious sphere to a global connection not merely a biblical story. Beyond the visual analysis of the altarpiece, it's also important to situate it within the context of global movement of people. Due to sparse archival materials, the exact date of this altarpiece was hard to identify. It yet could be assured that the altarpiece was already in St. Paul's in 1608 as an annual letter confirms. The Japanese Christians and the Jesuits gradually moved to Macau since early 1600, when Hideyoshi elevated his Christian band. This painting was likely produced when a Chinese-Japanese Jesuit, Jacob Niwa, who was trained in the seminary by Niccolo, moved to Macau requested by Valignano for the China mission in 1601. This Jesuit painter was associated with the overlooked Portuguese slavery trade between Japan and China. Whose father was Chinese, brought and bought to was Chinese, bought and brought to Nagasaki. The painter then naturally became a Christian, a Jesuit, and studied with Niccolo. This story was not rare. 
the construction of St. Paul's undeniably required the huge involvement of laborers that Valignano gained roughly 150 to 200 Chinese laborers who were later baptized and perhaps majorly from Guangdong, just next to Macau, since transportation was easy and cheap. In fact, the human trafficking was active in Macau, which was alert to main government. The unprecedented explosion of making others was through the slave trade. Discovery of new world and the West became the self, while the rest were turned into the other, including the emergence of races. Despite that, despite that the economic structure in Macau was slightly different, where no large mining work nor plantations occurred, the action of trading slaves did not alter the nature of slavery in this, in this context. In fact, many of the slaves were circulated from Macau or Nagasaki to Southeast Asia and Latin America for the heavy labor work, even to Europe, where slave and servant markets actually located in different piazzas. In 1621, some years after Matteo Ricci's success in Beijing, a ceremony for the veneration of Francis Xavier was housed in Macau that the procession paraded around the city. Perhaps not by coincidence, one year later, the canonization of five saints, Ignatius of La Viola, Francis Xavier, Teresa of Avila, Isidore of Madrid, and the Filippinelli took place in Rome. The statues of Ignatius and the Savior in St. Paul's echoed destinedly to celebrate the success in the Asia mission. St. Paul's was not merely standing in Macau, but at the crossroads of East, West, and Latin America even, witnessing changes, forces, and interactions that form the idea of early modern. St. Paul's indeed represented a global movement of architectural language, people, trade, in relation to always changing power dynamics. So thanks everyone. This, um, this is my sharing for today's.